Well, we all know it's a global world and car manufacturer certainly don't make that any easier to navigate. So this is the Nissan X-Trail, which is brand new to Europe. US viewers will have known this as the Nissan Rogue, which has existed in the States in this form for a year. But the news is there's a new engine that this is being launched with, a new powertrain in Europe. And of course, it's built on the same platform as the Nissan Qashqai in Europe or the Nissan Rogue Sport in the States. So I hope that's managed to make it a little bit less confusing. So here are the questions that we're gonna be trying to answer. One, is this credible competition for its German rivals? Have Nissan finally managed to elevate themselves out of what you could describe as the budget sector? This is a premium SUV. That's Nissan's statement. We're gonna take a closer look and find out. All of that starts with the design language. So as we look straight on at the front of this thing, what does it communicate to us? Nothing here exactly to blow your mind. And honestly, I think that that's a good thing. SUVs are a very difficult design proposition because they're large by nature, but you don't want to visually impose too much. Global products are even harder because in a country like America, visual presence is really important, Europe less so. So what you're trying to do always is find the right balance between those two things. The problem with managing to hit those design briefs is that you can risk ending up with a product that's neither one thing nor another. So for me, what Nissan have done really well with this design is that it doesn't make too big or too specific of a statement. Nothing here really blows you away, but I don't think that's a bad thing. What do you think? Four meters, 68 or 184 inches in length. I have to say that the side profile of this vehicle is a little bit more of a taste from the front. There's nothing particular here to hate, but for me, also nothing particular here to fall in love with. I do like the rugged feeling of these plastic trim elements on the wheel arches and on the bottom. And I will say that in contrast to a lot of other SUVs that you can have on the market, they feel properly solidly built and actually as though they're designed for off-road use. And I like that. That feeling is echoed in the 19 inch wheels that we have here and tires that look rugged enough to take a farm track such as this, but still not make you feel uncomfortable on the road. Looking at the side profile in total, I would definitely say that there is something reminiscent of Hyundai of this to me. Now, that's not that there's anything bad with Hyundai's design and that's not that there's anything bad with this design either, but I have the same kind of sensation of them both. Let's start off with the key. What I really like about this is it's very light and that's nice to carry around in your pocket. You know what? The more cars we're testing now, the better we're finding the finish quality of the build. I think that is a very high quality cabin proposition. And there are really nice details right throughout this thing. The last time I owned a Nissan, I did not think that I was ever gonna be looking at a cockpit that looked like that with the word Nissan written on it. They've come on so far. This really does speak to a new quality and a new approach to styling. It just makes me feel good. And you know what is very much reminiscent of its German rivals. So when I see this cockpit, I do start to think maybe, just maybe, there could be some viable competition. Let's take a seat inside and see if it feels as good as it looks. Well, right from the moment you take a seat in here, again, the overriding sensation you have is, wow, Nissan, really? Now I think the fairest competition for this car just being honest, is probably gonna be the Toyota RAV4. And Toyota, I'm a massive fan of, but I've also been complaining about for years. It's almost as though they were designing their interiors as if they'd never seen a car before for the longest time. And you could say the same thing of Nissan. But whereas Toyota, I still think are on the road to discovery in terms of making an interior that matches the quality of the people they want to compete with, this seems to have gotten it absolutely right. Everywhere you look, the material selection looks, feels, and behaves in a premium manner. I'm five foot 10 or 178 centimeters, but I do have a very long torso. So you can compare me sitting down to somebody of around about six foot one or six foot two. And as you can see, I have plenty of headspace here. That said, the seat is in its lowest possible position. As far as the seat itself goes, we have one under the top trim here, which means I have non-leather seats easy to keep clean and nice and hard wearing. It feels comfortable, 
but I don't know that I feel that well held. So it'll be interesting to see how it behaves once we actually start driving. Now, as far as the position within the car itself is concerned, I really feel nicely bedded down into this vehicle and everything has adjusted really nicely for me to feel good. Truthfully, I never have quite understood the point of motorized steering wheel adjustments. It just takes a hundred times longer than it needs to. I'm a fan of the manual and it takes no time at all for me to put this wheel exactly where I want it to be. Steering wheel itself, really nicely finished. As a piece of design, that really works for me. It communicates the brand, but look at these lovely buttons. I can push and feel these without needing to look at them at all. And there is no danger of me pressing something I didn't intend, even though there is clearly an awful lot of capacity to change things using these controls alone. This is the driver's cockpit as Cornelius is showing you. That's around about 12 inches from corner to corner, which coincidentally is the same as the infotainment screen as well. As you can see here, this is the standard display that it comes with, but of course you can adjust everything from the steering wheel here. So if I push on the settings, you can see how I can cycle through the various different displays. Now, although we've been doing a little bit of driving shooting just now, which has changed yet, I definitely think it's worth pointing out that this number right here was at 6.4 litres per 100 kilometres for efficiency. And the reason that's worth mentioning is that I believe for the first time ever, that is exactly what the manufacturers told us this car would deliver. So, two thumbs up for that. Now, if we take a look slightly further over, you can see the infotainment screen. That obviously is embedded into the dashboard and more or less has everything that you would expect. It's responsive, but not that responsive. The screen is a high gloss type, which means it's going to be showing up your fingerprints. Cornelius has been bravely standing outside <laughs> during the rain, but I asked him just to hop in here for one moment because I want to show you this. Now, if I pop the car into reverse, this is hardly a new feature and I'm sure you've seen it before, but this aerial view on this car, which doesn't always work spectacularly well everywhere that I've seen it applied, actually works here great. If you can see, I'm just reversing onto a very narrow, very small road in a vineyard and it allows me to do that really effectively. Now, the reason I'm particularly impressed by that is as you can see, there are rain all over the cameras but this system still works really well indeed. Slightly further down and hooray, look at this, an orgy of physical buttons that I can press. I'm not gonna care about most of these things, but I really enjoy being able to adjust the heating and cooling without ever needing to look at or think about it in any way, shape or form. Heated seats on this car, heated steering wheel, and easy to adjust fan speed right at a finger's push. Brilliant. Also well done Nissan for this execution down here. I love the fact that it has USB-C and USB-A right there in the dash. Yes, I know that this is the modern standard, but let's be realistic, 90% of everything I own still operates off one of those. This is an S21 Ultra, so it's a big phone, and as you can see, it fits in beautifully. Now I have a case on my phone, which means inductive charging can be a little temperamental in cars. So I'm sure if I took that off, it would work perfectly. However, they have given me this nice light down here. I'll just see if I can show you with the case off. That really does let you know if your phone is charging and what the state of it is. He said optimistically, come on phone, there we go. And you can see I have a helpful orange light so I can tell at a glance that everything is working exactly as it should do. Here we have the pure electric mode for this vehicle. Now it only has a 2.1 kilowatt battery. So when you ask the manufacturer, what does that really mean in terms of pure electric driving? They'll tell you that's three kilometers. Drive mode selector here. And then finally at the rear, the storage area for everything else. This car's killer feature was always going to be space. It sells an astonishing number already in China. And as we all know, the Chinese really, really love the space in the back. So that should not come as a huge surprise to you. Let's have a look. Well, this seat is set for me, so it's really an unfair comparison. I'm gonna slide over instead to where Cornelius sits. Cornelius, who has a normal body, is over six feet tall. And as you can see, look just how much room I have back here. Absolutely loads. And I've even got a couple of inches spare space above my head. 
Thank you, Nissan, for not thinking, as others do, that a coupe line is a good idea for an SUV. It really isn't. This is the benefit you gain when you just design for space. Acres of room back here. The seating, well, it does feel a little bit, should I say, less refined than the seating at the front. Obviously, the material selection is exactly the same, but there's even less holding me in place back here, meaning that if I'm doing a little bit of challenging riding, it's not the best rear seat experience for that. However, for around town, the seats are very firm, very supportive and comfortable. Loads of room, I'm gonna be more than happy. Let's find out if that fifth passenger can enjoy life at all. Well, it's not bad. It's not the best middle seat you ever sat in. It's very, very firm but there is still a lot of room. So in sum, I would say, yes, you can be comfortable back here. From 575 liters to 1,396, the rear should have more than enough space. And fortunate to our driving so far, I'm really pleased that there's a button on the key fob that means I don't have to touch it. Well, as with the interior at the front, What's really pleasing to me about the first look at the rear is that it delivers on a quality that you're not fully expecting after only having looked at the aesthetic. I quite like these contrasting colors back here, and this is an already well-known but extremely useful and practical Nissan innovation, which is a split part floor from front to back. So you can actually have different levels for different bits of your floor, depending on exactly what it is that you want to put in here. Now, I guess you could think that's a little bit of a faff, and 99% of the time, you're just gonna keep these lids absolutely in place. And when they say flat, they actually do properly mean flat, which means that you've got more than enough load space back here for anything most regular people could expect to need to carry. Now, Thomas would never forgive me if I didn't give you the direct dimensions, so let's have a look. You can fit a width fitting in here of around about, well, let's be really brutal and take it down to the flat part, 41 inches or about one meter five. For depth, load space right through to the back. Well, effective back, which is obviously the lip of the load space, 36 inches or about 91 centimeters. And with the seat fully folded down, gonna need to fully extend this. Now this is actually good because Thomas is always saying if only he had an SUV in which he could transport one of his extendable rulers without needing to collapse it in any way. Oh, Nissan didn't quite make the cut, but it's not that far off. We come up to around about 180 centimeters or about 71 inches. And I suspect you could probably actually even get a little bit more than that in there, especially depending on your size. Now, why, why did I say that? It's because, of course, the smaller you are, as with my legs, the further seat actually goes forward. I wish I'd have had a camera on me, but I recently just fitted a 2.4 meter countertop into a Nissan Micra, and I'm not making it up. And if anyone wants to bet me it's not possible, I'll do it again, but you'll have to pay for the new countertop. Now, if we look at the top to bottom access here, it comes in at around about 35 inches, or 90 centimeters. So you almost have a full cubed meter of direct load into this thing. And thanks to the way in which it's designed, if Cornelius takes a bit of a step back, you can see that a cupboard, a chest of drawers, anything else that is huge and bulky is literally gonna slot directly into the rear of this. I've seen an awful lot of SUVs. This looks a really good proposition for loading and unloading stuff. Let's take a look and see what's powering this thing. Okay, well, what you are looking at there is a 1.5 liter three cylinder engine, and that doesn't power the car. That powers the electric battery or sends power directly to the electric motors. You have two of those, 150 kilowatt at the front and 100 kilowatts at the back that produces a combined system output of 214 horsepower. The idea being that that petrol engine produces all the power that's necessary in order to keep the battery, which is a 2.1 kilowatt, fully topped up and running optimally to power the car. It does have a theoretical pure electric range of about three kilometers, which you can access for driving around town. 
So power test time. As you may remember, I mentioned earlier that if the battery can't supply what the electric motors want, the power distribution changes and the engine is now supplying the electric motors direct through the alternator. So let's see what all of that translates to. I found a bit of road with a nice hill on it. Why? We all know that three cylinder engines hate hills. And I wanna see what the most that this car can give me is. Seven seconds of promised delivery. I've put it in sports mode. I'm very excited about that. Let's put our foot down and see what happens. Ready? Ready, Cornelius? Let's go. Actually, it's not bad. It's really not bad. It's working. That seven seconds felt pretty good, actually. And you know what? I felt secure. I felt that the car was not in any way disappointing at all, actually. I have to be honest, I was expecting that to be a bit of a blowout. I thought I would put my foot down, then wait, and nothing much would happen. But you know what? It was good. Well, that was sports mode. It's only right that we try it again in standard. Same road, same incline, now standard mode. Now, Cornelius, the challenge here is you have to find in any way something that is different between this and sports. Are you ready? Yes. Let's go. And no. Any difference? No. No. Same feeling again though, actually really pleasing power delivery. I think I found my sweet spot for a larger SUV, seven seconds. I think that's good. If you look at the power curve in terms of what's required to make a car deliver at different levels, I want to say seven seconds is probably around about optimal. Once you go below that, so we did the way coffee zero one and that was five seconds you really have to use a lot of energy to move this kind of weight and this kind of size through the air. So seven for me feels like the right power for this platform. What do you think? Well, it's about time we got out onto the road with the brand new X-Trail, or if you're watching in America, Rogue. And yes, I know, if you're watching in America, it's not quite brand new over there. But I tell you what is brand new, and that's the three-cylinder, one-and-a-half-litre engine that this thing is now equipped with. So if you bought your Rogue last year in the States, ah, bad luck, you just missed out on this, and you may well want to think about if it's worth your time upgrading. Because I have to tell you, a lot of innovation has taken place there. Yes, I know that this car has a different drive platform and is a slightly different proposition, but it's still the same one and a half litre engine that you would find in the standard internal combustion engine version. Now, on top of variable displacement, it also has the ability to deliver the most efficient version of what Nissan at least think you can achieve with a three cylinder engine. If you have experience of driving around with a three cylinder, that might make you grind your teeth a little bit and say, come on though, Brian, I'm just not interested in doing that. But wait, I promise you, they're really worth checking out. They're not what you think and they get better all the time. So this one in particular comes originally from Infinity. I don't know if you've ever experienced it in their car, but they've had an awful lot of time to refine this and it works really well in this platform. Now that said, that's not what this specific car has been set up to do. This specific car is the E-Force, which is a really interesting take on the proposition of hybrid. So regular viewers may know, I'm not the world's biggest fan of hybrid cars. The reason being to me, it kind of feels like the worst of both worlds. You have to lug around twice as much equipment, twice the effective costs, and the only benefit that you get from that is an extended range. Well, okay, better fuel economy as well, but you have to drive an awful lot of miles in one to really see the value of that. So this then is a slightly different proposition. This only uses the engine to charge the battery. That's it. Now, if that sounds a bit odd, the obvious advantage to that is that you don't need to have a big battery because it is not a standard hybrid in any sense at all. So what that means in real world use is that you get a driving experience that in principle is a lot more like an electric car in some ways and a lot more like an internal combustion engine in others. Because you have a large effective range, this car should do around about... You can interrupt the voice prompt and give a command. I'd love to interrupt the voice prompt, thank you. 
this car should have an effective range of around about 750 kilometers. Well, that's pretty great, especially for a potentially seven seat SUV. But on top of that, you're not gonna be able to charge the battery because it's so small. Well, one, there's no technology to allow you to do it, but two, the effective range of this in pure EV mode is only a slightly brilliant three kilometers. And if you think, why? Why would anyone build such a platform? As Nissan will point out to you, the vast majority of trips you ever take around town in an EV are brilliantly actually less than three kilometers. So that might end up being an awful lot more useful than you think. In real world everyday usage, however, the system is set up to work standardly like this. The petrol three cylinder, one and a half liter engine runs pretty much permanently charging the battery through obviously a current alternator that then um, allows you to power in this car two electric motors. You have 150 kilowatts in the front and 100 in the rear, giving you a slight front wheel bias, which is not unusual at all. Now that is the electric benefit of the car. That results in a performance of around about seven seconds for zero to 100. But this is where it gets a bit more complicated. If you put your foot down and really demand, now in a standard hybrid, it would use that power to drive the engine itself. In this car, what it will then do is send that power directly through the alternator to the electric motors, allowing the car to intelligently decide where its best use of that power is, either sending it direct to the battery, a proportion of it to the battery, or a proportion of it to the electric motors themselves. All of that is nothing you're gonna care about if you actually own and drive this car. It's just to give you an idea of how this technology is being applied. Real world, what all of that adds up to is that you get the power that you would want and hope for from a car this size as an electric vehicle, the range you would hope for from a hybrid, and theoretically the ease of driving and dare I say cost that you would hope to get for from the internal combustion engine. I think it's really worth considering smaller battery, massive saving on weight, makes the car much more efficient and hopefully makes it cheaper and easier to run and maintain. Okay, I'm on pretty thin ice with that one, but all of which is to say, I start this test drive feeling pretty positive about the proposition. I think it's a nice take on what we could be looking at as we're moving further forwards into pure electric platform, excuse me, platforms. Now, if you consider the different options that are available for this, first of all, Cornelius is gonna have a go at managing to get this charming lady to stop talking to us. <laughs> I think what's happened is that she's telling us about the menus. I think that's what's happened, there we go. So I am more than delighted to learn that they finally figured out how to bring an air of refinement into their cars. Look at this, it's great. It feels modern, it's stylish, the material selection is good. Is it gonna blow your mind? No, it's really not. But you know what? It feels solid, it feels well put together, it feels stylish, and it does just enough. This is the Techna line, that's one under the top, which is Techna Plus, and I think gives you just enough of the extra bells and whistles that you're probably gonna want. The head-up display is nice, it's not too hard to adjust, doesn't have any automatic brightness adjustment, so on a day like today, I really had to dim it down as low as it would go so it wasn't glaring at me. But I did like the fact that I was able to get it for once into a right position for me to drive. You gotta get the Techna line or above if you want that to come on this car. Drive experience, well, you know, there's not a huge amount to get blown away by, but at the end of the day, it is a seven seat potential SUV. So you really wouldn't expect it to be too exciting to drive. What is exciting immediately right off the bat is the comfort and the build quality of this vehicle. Everything feels really well put together. And although it doesn't blow your world, it does present as being very nice, thank you very much. I wish they'd used more of that brushed black plastic effect here instead of all of this high gloss, famously great for fingerprints. But I do appreciate the fact there are still some tactile knobs and buttons. This volume button in the middle, which allows you to adjust and mess around with it without bothering to look, that's great. And believe it or not, 
still tactile realistic heating and cooling controls which ignoring the fact they're finished in high gloss black plastic actually are super easy to address without bothering to spend any time looking at it. That combined with the head-up display mean that my driving experience here really is focused on exactly that. Seats, well they're firm and supportive, they're not amazing, certainly they don't give me quite as much side support as I might like, but they do the job and they certainly do feel as if they're going to be comfortable over longer distances. The steering wheel itself is really good. I'm a big fan of these manual controls. It's great to have buttons, it's great that they're clearly delineated so I can easily push and adjust what I want without needing to look at it. That said, when you do it, and let's see if we can cycle through some menu options here, they do feel a bit plasticky to push on. So steering wheel, seat, steering wheel controls, all echoing just a little bit of the, uh, I still feel the Nissan underneath it all. But that is quite a harsh complaint. The really good thing is it all feels solid and well built and I really appreciate that. Now in terms of what you're actually gonna get when you're driving around in this thing, it won't surprise you to learn that it does have a different level of regeneration. And here, I'm always complaining about this, I don't understand why more firms don't do what Mazda do, put it on a stalk, allow you to adjust it, and then you can have a bit more fun playing with it. Here, it's a small button, irritatingly located right in the center of the console here, and it's right next to the pure EV mode, which means really irritatingly easy to hit by mistake. Nissan call it the E-pedal, and you can see if I push this, there's the regeneration. Now, it's actually not badly delivered. I think once you get used to it, you're gonna find yourself using that by way of one pedal driving an awful lot more than the brake because it's practical and it improves your efficiency. My only two real gripes are one, why? Why place it there and make it so hard to get to? Are they just assuming customers won't bother using it or they'll set it and forget it? I mean, that's not my experience of these things. I like to adjust them as I go depending on how and where I'm driving. That's quite a lot of drag. That's all from the e-pedal, nothing from the brake at all. So I would have liked that clearer and easier to access, and I would have liked different levels of recuperation, but you know what? You can't have everything. 150 kilowatts in the front, 100 in the back, gives us a combined system output of 214 horsepower. And if I put my foot down, Well, promises a zero to 100 time of seven seconds. That's 100 kilometers per hour or 62 miles per hour, round about there. But, you know, to be honest, I think that's more than sufficient. Yes, there's a little bit of delay in actually getting what you want, but it's an SUV. And this especially is an SUV that's designed to deliver efficiency, which those two things don't naturally sit happily in the same zone. So if you want a performance, come on, Porsche makes some really amazing cars. But how often are you really going to be putting your foot down? Now, I started off this clip by asking, is it possible for you to save the money? Are the non-German models now coming to a level where you can realistically say, you know what, I'm not going to feel bad shame. And in actual fact, I can get what I want from a cheaper model. Well, I would have loved for the answer to that to honestly have been yes. But the answer is, well, kind of. On the upside, the finish in fit out of this is superb. If I put this against a more reasonable direct competition, which would be the Toyota RAV4, I have to tell you, I think it wins. As is so often the case with Toyota, I kind of want to say in the pure agricultural sturdiness of the engine and the layout, Toyota have the edge but in terms of refinement and the finish of the vehicle and your enjoyment of ownership, I'm gonna give it to Nissan. And that's important because it means you are then entering a region in which you're looking at more expensive German models that before simply hasn't been remotely possible. While we're on the subject of talking about comparing this car to higher models, everyone's familiar with the jog shuttle wheel on older Mercedes and of course, the ability to be able to change between modes. Well, this car, rather charmingly, also has different driving modes. Why do I say rather charmingly? Well, there's a sports mode on it. 
I'm not massively ambitious about that, but let's check it out and see what happens. That sport, I'm currently driving 80 kilometers. Let's put the foot flat down and see what happens. Okay. Any difference, Cornelius? Let's, by direct comparison, put that straight back into standard mode. No. And 80 again, foot flat down. I think no difference. I think that is 100% the same. I don't really know why they put different driving modes onto cars like this. I don't really see the benefit. But that said, this is four wheel drive and there is a snow mode and a rain mode. So possibly you'll find some use out of those. But here we are in standard mode, no problem at all. I think to be honest, for the most time you own this vehicle, you'll just stick it in standard and forget about it. So we've done a really interesting series of looks of late at cars performing in segments you wouldn't necessarily expect them to perform in. I was very impressed by the Coffee Zero One. If you haven't seen it, check that out. I think that this car performs very well in the segment in which it finds itself. So is this gonna convert somebody who really drives an Audi, a BMW, a Mercedes? No, that's the honest answer, no it isn't but it is gonna convert somebody who's just gotten sick and tired of paying the premium purchase price and the servicing as well. When you compare this to a reasonable field, which has more similar marks in it, it actually does very well indeed. And the fact is, after you've finished driving up and down your street at high speed in a Macan S, there's only so many times you can do that before you go to the garage and then have to pay the cost for doing that that might change the way that you think about this car. What I can tell you is I'm genuinely excited about this new take on the hybrid platform. I think it's a really good solution. It's always irked me driving around with massive weight increase because of batteries, especially if you're in a non-EV. And none of that applies here. It looks, feels and handles like what you would say in Europe is a larger SUV and obviously in the States is a compact SUV. And I think it speaks very well to all of the markets it operates in. So there's not enough here to make it distinct and unique. But what there is, is everything finished really well. Is this the fastest SUV? No. Is it the most economic SUV? No. Is it the most sporty or the most fun? No, no to everything. It doesn't excel in any single field I can think of except one. It does the best across all of those levels. If you put them all together and you say, what do I really want from buying a car like this? And the answer to that question is, I wanna be comfortable, I wanna feel safe, I wanna have a car that's gonna hold its value and feel solidly well built. And I never wanna to have to deal with range anxiety ever again. You know what? There is an awful lot compelling you to take a look at this. I like it. Yeah, it's not gonna be my car of choice for any one of the reasons, but put them all together and it's really a very nice proposition indeed.